Amen. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Bobby, for that wonderful prayer. I got to tell you, folks, God's still on his throne. God's still in control. He is still worthy of our praise. Sometimes life gets tough. Sometimes life seems a little bleak even. But there is never a moment where he's not in charge. So let's continue to lift his name on high. Let's continue to glorify his name in everything that we do, for he is holy. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Now, as you're turning there, I have, well, some people would call this a confession to make. I think it's more of a proclamation. I really enjoy Christian movies. It's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? There are a lot of people out there that really can't stand Christian movies. They say Christian movies are just so formulaic, right? There's a formula they follow. The underdog always wins the game, right? The couple is having trouble, but one of them comes to faith in Jesus or starts to take their relationship with Jesus more seriously, and everything turns out fine, right? It seems that's the formula for all Christian movies, but honestly, that's also kind of the formula for Hallmark movies. That's the formula for romantic comedy. That's the formula for a lot of our entertainment that we enjoy today, isn't it? I've got to tell you, I like that because life's not always like that, is it? It seems sometimes in Christian movies, failures come, but they just simply encourage the, the main characters to try harder, to work harder, to pray harder, or all of the above. But in reality, sometimes life knocks you down, doesn't it? And sometimes, I'm just being honest here, it's hard to get back up right away. Um, I, I was telling somebody earlier, I had to install a dishwasher at my house, and uh, I am not a plumber. In, in case any of you need plumbing help, you can call me and I'll tell you who else to call, but I'm not the one to call. But I can get by. I, I've put in many wa- uh, dishwashers before, but I didn't made a mistake and had to pull it all out and start over again, so I just lay there on my kitchen floor for a little while saying, really, Lord, come on, please help me get this done. Sometimes stuff happens. I know that seems kind of silly and it seems kind of minor, and it is. But in reality, sometimes life comes by and throws you a harder blow than that, doesn't it? Sometimes it's a hard one to recover from. But that's just real. That's just the world that we have here in front of us. That's the world that God is still in charge of. Often, those happy endings that we always seem to see and those crimes that get solved in an hour on television. That's just not the way life really works. I mean, certainly we want to do our best and we want to foster a culture where success occurs, where discipleship occurs, but the reality is sometimes in the world we live in, not everybody will accept Christ. Not everybody will understand the gospel like we want them to understand it. Sometimes... Sometimes it's people that we work with, people that we've ministered to. Sometimes it's friends or neighbors. Sometimes it's family members, and it's really gut-wrenching. But not everybody is going to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, the Word predicts this. And it still confuses me to this day how anybody can know who Jesus Christ is and not accept Him as their Lord and Savior. I don't understand that. I really don't. But my life has taught me That's what happens sometimes. Here in the end of chapter 12 in the book of John, though, we find John reiterating that not everybody accepted Christ in his day either. People who saw the miracles, people who heard the teachings from Jesus Christ himself, still did not accept him as Messiah. And and, and, and how, you know, in, in some strange way, this really gives me hope. Because the reality is, When people reject the gospel, when we share the gospel with them, who are they rejecting? They're rejecting you? No, they're rejecting him. Is that your fault? No. It's our responsibility to be obedient in sharing the gospel. But as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? Same goes for the gospel. And it's our job to be good stewards of the gospel. But here... John reiterates 
that not everybody responded to Christ either. And how does Jesus react when people don't accept him for who he is? Well, he responds with sadness. But you know what else he does? He stays on mission. Never once did Jesus go, that's it, they're not worth it. And isn't that a good thing? He's right. In a lot of ways, I look around and I look at myself and say, Lord, this world is just so against you. I don't understand why you put up with us. But folks, that's what love does. And he loves us so, so much. And we need to do the same thing, even when things don't go our way, even when the ball bounces a funny way, even when we've shared the gospel passionately, yet seemingly no fruit is coming. What do we need to do? Pray and stay on mission. For us, what's that mission? That mission is the Great Commission. We're to be going and making disciples. I find it kind of interesting that this kind of introduction, this kind of a sometimes things don't go our way, and we've had more technical difficulties this morning than we've had in a long time. And even right now, we're not streaming live because, I don't know, but I'll be uploading this later uh, to our Facebook page so hopefully people can enjoy it and hopefully God's word can be proclaimed. But the reality of it is sometimes things don't go our way, and what do we do? we got to keep at it. We're going to be looking at today's passage kind of in in two parts. The first part starts in John chapter 12, verse 37. It says, Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. But this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, who said, Lord, who has believed our message? And who has the arms of the Lord been revealed to? This is why they were unable to believe, because Isaiah also said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and be converted, and I will heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many did believe in him, and even among the rulers, but among the Pharisees, they did not confess him, so they would not be banned from the synagogue For they loved praise of men more than the praise from God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us every single day. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of your gospel. Help us, Lord, to keep at it. Help us to continue to share your love and your grace in this dark world that is in such desperate need of it. And Father, I just pray that you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. John starts this passage with a truly, what I find to be a heartbreaking statement. He says, even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This must have frustrated Jesus so much. I mean, John's telling us of his eyewitness testimony of Jesus facing the stubborn misunderstanding and angry rejection of the very ones who should have accepted him at every single turn. You would think the Jews who have been looking for their Messiah for thousands of years, and when he finally shows up, shouldn't they embrace him? Shouldn't they say, he is finally here? But that's not what happened. But this fulfilled... You know, I mean, John told us this was going to happen. John 1, 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But this rejection really goes even deeper than just witnessing his miracles. It's also really a rejection of the very prophecies that have pointed towards the Messiah throughout all of Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. I mean, right here, John quotes two passages from Isaiah. Isaiah is one of those books that is just full of, of what we call messianic prophecies, prophecies concerning the Messiah. Just in the book of Isaiah, there are 38 separate prophecies of Messiah. Some of them are repeated numerous times. Isaiah is one of those books that are just absolutely chock full of prophecy. And and Jesus' main enemies during his earthly ministry were the ones who knew the Old Testament better than anyone. They were the ones whose job it was, whose calling in life it was to to serve God by helping other people understand these very prophecies that Jesus was fulfilling. 
How in the world could they have missed this message so badly? First John quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1, Lord, who has believed our message? You see, they had seen all of these miracles. They have neither heard nor understood his teachings. And where does Jesus' teachings, where do they come from? They come from the Father, directly from the Father, through the Son, to God's chosen people, and praise the Lord to us Gentiles as well. And the as Isaiah passage continues, it says, And who has seen the arm of I mean sorry, and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? In other words, his mighty works of provision, his mighty works of healing. They have either seen or heard about Jesus feeding five thousand men with what a, equates to a first century lunchable. And yet he took that food, and not only did he feed everyone, but had 12 baskets left over. He also fed 4,000 people at one sitting. He has provided so much, and he has also been a, a God of healing. He has healed the lame. He has made the blind see. He has made the dumb talk. He has cast out demons. He has even raised people from the dead. They have seen all of this, yet they reject him. How in the world could people be so blind? And then I look around at the world we live in and have to ask, how in the world can we be so blind? We need to be careful. I'm you know, not fussing at them too much because the reality is we rub elbows with Pharisees every single day. And if we're not careful, we become one sometimes too. And it's all about the love and the grace of Jesus. When, when, I mean, when Isaiah wrote these words, he didn't know anything about John chapter 12. He didn't know anything about Jesus Christ being the Messiah. He, he didn't know anything about first century society in, in, in the Middle East. His original readers certainly didn't know anything about this kind of stuff. But Isaiah's words find their final fulfillment at this moment. Jesus as the fulfillment of the whole prophetic ministry of the Old Testament. All of it points to him. Yet Jesus experiences the exact same thing most of those Old Testament prophets experience. And they did miracles as well, yet how were they received in their societies? Rejection. How come we always reject what's best for us, it seems? Because we too are a stiff-necked people. John then quotes Isaiah 6, chapter 10. Isaiah 6 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's when Isaiah has been lifted spiritually into the throne room of heaven itself and gets to witness the true glory of God. And, and at the end of that, John quotes, I mean, sorry, Isaiah, Isaiah writes this. He says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and be converted, and I would heal them. i got to tell you, I read this passage, and on first glance, this is kind of confusing. It's kind of like, are you saying that God made their hearts be hardened? Are you saying that God made them not be able to see just so he wouldn't heal them? That doesn't sound like God. That doesn't sound like love. That doesn't sound like grace. I mean, it can't mean that, and I'll tell you why it can't mean that. Because if it does mean that, then 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 is false. It says, this is good, and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's truth. Because everything in here is truth. <clears throat> and any time we think something in here is contradicted by another verse, you know what we need to do? Take a look at our interpretation, because it doesn't. It all fits together beautifully and perfectly. All right, so what, what, what did God mean? Well, what it means to me is God knew that these folks would decide. He knew what they would decide. He knew the Pharisees would turn away Jesus Christ before the Pharisees' grandparents were even born. He knew all this before he breathed the breath of life into Adam in Genesis chapter 1. And just because God foreknew what they were going to choose doesn't mean God made them choose it. We have free will. God didn't want to create a race of robots who who just obeyed his every command no matter what. He wanted us to choose love. He wanted us to choose grace. He wanted us to choose him. And folks, we got a choice. We got a choice. You have a choice. All of us have a choice. We can either live for this world or we can live for him. 
That's it. It's not very uplifting all the time, is it? Because this world is a bad place sometimes. It's a cruel place sometimes. It's a place where we have to see people suffer. (coughs) Excuse me. But the reality of it is, it's all on us. It's all on our decisions and what we do. It would be much more convenient. It would be much just easier if we could blame all this on God, the condition of our world and the condition of so many hearts and souls. But that's not the truth, is it? Because the truth is, our world's a mess is because so many people are a mess and have chosen not to follow God. <coughs> I mean, if someone doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be, whose fault is that? It's theirs. Whose fault is it that the Jews didn't accept Jesus Christ for who he is? Theirs. Who, whose fault is it that your neighbor or coworker or friend or family member didn't accept Christ after you share the gospel with them? Theirs. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, it usually runs through my mind, well, I could have explained that better. I could have said that better. I could have been more passionate about it. I could have used more scripture. And these things may or may not be true, because it all boils down to one thing, and that's each and every one of us have a decision to make, folks. It's the same decision that Joshua had. When he proclaimed, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We all have a choice. And and the real problem with humanity is that we're born naturally blind of eye and heart of heart. All right? We, We can't hear the truth. We can't absorb the truth without the Holy Spirit's help. The human heart isn't naturally good. And it's not naturally likely to believe good in others. Uh, That sounds real depressing, but is it not true? There are many people in this world that we live in today that they see something good coming. What are they looking for? They're looking for, okay, when's the other shoe going to drop? There's got to be a catch here because life is never that easy. Let me tell you, accepting Jesus Christ is exactly that easy. It's simply unseating yourself from the throne of your heart and giving it to him. Letting him be in charge of all of our actions and all of our, what we say, what we do, what we don't do. Let him be in charge of everything that we're about. And when we let him be in charge, then we can live a life that glorifies God. That, folks, is exactly what we're here for. Is to glorify God in everything that we do. It's not until through the power of the Holy Spirit that we experience what's described in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, Ezekiel 36, 26, and Jeremiah 31, 33. All of those verses say we trade our heart of stone for what? A heart of flesh. And then when we have that heart of flesh, then Hebrews 8, 10 happens in our lives. It says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's what it's all about, folks. That's what it was all about during Jesus' time. That's what it's all about for us. And that's what it will be about until Jesus returns. And even then, it's it's all about his word. Always. Does this mean that the door is forever closed to the Jews? No, not at all. Verse 42 starts with one of those wonderful words. It says, nevertheless. In other words, John's saying, look, it can get bad when we reject Jesus. But nevertheless, even though it can be bad, nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? I think what Jesus is talking about here is people like Nicodemus that we talked about in John chapter 3 who visited Jesus at night, right? He, he was a very important man. He was a ruler amongst the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Yet he heard Jesus and it made sense to him. It spoke to his heart. He saw the truth of what Jesus was proclaiming. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. But did he become a bold follower of Jesus Christ? Not at first. Not at first at all. And I don't think he was the only one. They believed, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him so they would not be banned from the synagogue. You see, they didn't act on their belief because they were afraid of the powers that be. 
And the powers that be during this time had a lot of influence over their lives. They could kick them out of the synagogue, which isn't just saying you can't come back to church. It's really kicking them out of all of society. It's what we talked about in John chapter 9, when the man who was born blind, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees just insisted that he turn in for wrongdoing the man who healed him on the Sabbath. And you know what his response was? All I know for sure is I was once blind, but now I can see. And the reality was, in that conversation between the Pharisees and the man who was born blind, by the end of that conversation, who's the one that's proving their blindness? It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees, spiritually proving their blindness. Because I've got to be honest with you, in this world that we live in, there are all kinds of folks that are stumbling around because they are spiritually blind. Is this the kind of faith, you know, I mean, you know, these people, they believed, but they wouldn't stand up for that belief. Is this the kind of faith that Jesus wants us to have? No, it's not. He wants us to be bold in our witness. He wants to be bold in our faith. You see, it's not the kind of faith that's willing to suffer for the cause. It's not the kind of faith that will take up their cross daily and follow him. But at the same time, we need to be gracious because a lot of times where we are is not where we're going to stay. And in the kingdom of God, it's not about where we start, it's about where we end, right? And it's that trajectory of that growth is occurring in our lives. So when we do run across people who are believers, but they're not very bold in their witness, we need to be full of grace and full of mercy as, as we try to encourage them to take a stand for things. i, I got to be honest with you, when you just turn on the news, I think we see some of this kind of stuff going on just in the Afghanistan crisis that Bobby prayed for earlier. There are so many folks, they're going to have a choice to make. They're going to have to choose, am I going to take a stand for Jesus Christ knowing it might cost me my life and my family's life? Or am I going to say what they want to hear and ask for forgiveness later? Now, is Jesus a forgiving God? Absolutely. But if we're really living for him, we need to be bold, no matter what the cost. And you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, Nash, that's Afghanistan. That's the Middle East. They've always had problems. That will never come to the United States of America, will it? I hope not. But the reality is our faith sometimes can cost us something. Matter of fact, our faith will cost us something. And when that time comes when our faith costs us something, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and boldly proclaim the words that Jesus will give us through the Holy Spirit right at that time. I don't know what I'll say when that time comes, but I know my God will stand there with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And for even if, if people aren't quite there yet, that's fine. As Zechariah 4.10 says, we shouldn't scoff at small beginnings. That's a stage in the development and the growth of your faith. And it's my prayer we will all continue to mature in our faith to where we can also boldly take a stand for God. You see, the central problem for these believers here that John is describing, and honestly, I think the central problem for a lot of folks who claim Christianity right here in the world that we live in today is verse 43. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Again, before we're too critical of other folks, we need to deal with our own hesitancy and our own fear of social pressures, right? I was a youth minister for a lot of years. You know, what we talked about constantly is this thing called peer pressure, right? You know, peer pressure doesn't end after you get out of high school. We all still experience it every day of our lives. What does the world expect from me? That should come in a distant second compared to what does God expect from me. And we need to be obedient to him in everything that we do. A, a, a Christian poet and priest from the 19th century, a gentleman by the name of Studdart Kennedy, tells an explorer who brought back a, an exotic animal that he had never seen before. And he brought this animal back for his kids to see because it just amazed him. And this animal was a chameleon. 
They'd never seen a chameleon before. You set it down on something and it blends into its surroundings beautifully. And that's a form of defense for the chameleon because if you can't see it, you can't eat it, right? And, and so you put it down on a green tablecloth and what color does that chameleon turn? Green. Put it down on a red napkin, what color does that chameleon turn? Red. Well, the, the explorer had to go off on another trip. Now, again, this is not reality. This is a story, okay, but it proves a point. The, the, the explorer went off another trip, and he left his kids in charge of taking care of the chameleon. So one day they had him out, and they were playing with him, putting him on that green tablecloth and then the red napkin and then any other color they could find. And finally one of them said, hey, let's go put him over there and see what happens. And they put him on top of a patchwork quilt. And it had so many different colors on it, and that chameleon just didn't know what to do. And so, poof, right there, it died. So I can't do this. I can't blend into this. Folks, that's where we should all get to because there's so many Christians out there that just want to blend into society. They just they want to kind of be camouflaged, right? We talked about camo Christians several years ago, and we aren't to be camouflaged in our faith. It's not like, okay, Lord, I love you, but, but i got to go be me during the week, and I'll come back and reconnect with you on Sunday, and we'll get along just fine. That's not how we're called to live, is it? When do we live our faith? 24-7, all the time time. We are not called to blend in. We are called to stick out. And we're called to stick out for the glory of God, not for the glory of self. If you want to stick out because you want to make your name for yourself, there's a place in the Bible that talks about that where these people built this tower, right? Babel didn't turn out well for them, did it? Because they wanted to make a name for themselves. We need to stand up and stand out because we want to glorify and honor his name. That is how we are called to live. Don't be a chameleon Christian. So how do we avoid these, these worldly desires, these, the, the pull of the world? How do we avoid being a chameleon Christian? Well, it's simple. We answer one question. Whose glory do you seek? Are we seeking man's glory or God's? Are we seeking man's definition of greatness or God's? Are we seeking man's praise or are we seeking God's praise? I mean, there are really many times when in life gets so simple and gets so easy and that lack of opposition that we have to our faith just, just makes it real easy to kind of get very comfortable with things and, and not to have to really declare whose approval we'd rather have, God's or man's, because there's a lot of commonality there. But I also got to tell you, in my reading of this book, that's going to start changing gradually. And if we're really truly living our faith, it's going to start looking a lot different than the rest of the world. And the question we all have to answer is, what are we going to do when that time comes? Again, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us. This, this, this question, this, this whose glory do you seek, really sets the table for the last part of John chapter 12. Christ gave us a summary here of his mission here on earth. Christ came for God's glory, and we should strive for the same. Starting John chapter 12, starting in verse 44, it says, Then Jesus cried out. Notice this is not a secret. This is not something he's trying to hide under a bushel, as the children's song goes. No, what's he going to do? He's going to let it shine. He cries out in a loud voice, so as many people as possible can hear him. What does he cry out? He says, the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken of my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. See, this last paragraph here, if you will, of Jesus' public ministry is recorded in the Gospel of John it is really just a summation of why he came and what he is here for. You see, Jesus cries out basically, if you believe in God, you should believe in me. 
And for us on the other side of the cross here in the 21st century, this is, this is really obvious, right? Because Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. But i got to tell you, this really, really irritated those Pharisees and Sadducees who were trying to run away from Jesus. He basically said, you say you love Yahweh? Well, you should love me too. They didn't want to hear that. Matter of fact, I think that really caused a lot of pushback. But the reality is, faith in Jesus Christ is the standard by which we can tell if you're seeking God's glory or not. Because if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting God. Verse 46, Jesus returns to one of the key themes in John's gospel, light. See, salvation is like bringing somebody out of a dark room and into the light. They can suddenly see everything, and they see everything differently. Sin is darkness. You can't see. You stumble. You fall. Salvation is like coming into the light. Everything is clear. Everything looks different. The problem with everything being clear is well, we can see into all those little dusty corners, right? Before I went into the ministry, I was a band director, and I, I, I was a band director at two schools, and I remember the first time as the Leeds High School band director, I saw the Leeds High School band room. Principal went in there, we turned on the lights, and about one out of every five of them came on. And she said, that's a problem. I'll fix that by next week. I said, well, thank you. We need to be able to see what we're doing. And I was looking around that darkened band room, and it looked great. It was clean. Everything looked great. I mean, it was state-of-the-art 1975, but that's okay. It had been there a little while, but it was in good shape. You know what she did? She went and fixed all those light bulbs just like she said she was going to do, and I came back in that next week. I flipped on those lights, and that band room looked a lot different. I figured out the first thing we needed to do was clean, and after we cleaned, we needed to repaint because I couldn't see all that when it was so dim. But when there was a light shined on it, I saw the problems. And that's what a lot of people don't like about Jesus. Because when he shines that light into the dark, dusty corners of our hearts, we say, ooh, I got some work to do here. And all of us do, folks. Every single one of us, we got some corners that need cleaning out. But the good news is we don't have to do it by ourselves. In that band room, I called all my student leaders together and I said, guess what, guys, we're having a work day at the band room. They all came in, they cleaned, we painted the room, and then it did look pretty good. It was hard work, but it was worth it. Because when people walked into that room again, they said, hey, something's different around here. And that's how people should be when they experience us, when they come into our presence when we've been with Jesus. Hey, something's different here. And that goes for our salvation, and that goes on through our entire lives here on earth. The more we spend time with Jesus, the more like Jesus we will be. And the more people will see Jesus when they look at us. Now in verse 47, Jesus basically just reiterates John 3, 17, right? He didn't come into the world to judge the world. Why did he come on his first coming? He came for salvation. He came to save the world. Now we all know he's coming back, right? And when he comes back, he will be back to judge the world. But what criteria is he going to use to judge the world when he returns? The word he spoke when he was here the first time. We already know the answers to the test, folks. Have you ever had a class that the teacher passed out the test about a week before and said, go home and study this, and then you'll be do fine on the test, right? I didn't have that experience many times. I kind of wish I had. Because then I could have looked at all the answers. I could have learned them, and then I could have aced the test. We got all the answers that we need right here, folks. Every single one of them. And one day when we all stand in front of God, up on His throne, looking absolutely huge, and there's minuscule little us looking down here like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? There's two options here. We're either going to stand on our own and fail. Or we're going to stand with Jesus. And he's going to say, hey, Dad, this is Nash. He's with me. And that's the only way we're going to pass that judgment, folks. Because God expects from us perfection, and we cannot deliver. But God is faithful to forgive. See, verse 48 tells us the words that he speaks during his first coming will judge those who reject him on the last day when he returns. And really, the challenge here 
really in, in the contents of, of verses 42 and 43 really talk about it's not about some kind of intellectual assent to the teachings of Jesus. Is that important? Yes. We need to understand what the Word of God is telling us to do because you've got to know what you're supposed to do before you can do it. But it doesn't stop at intellectual assent, right? It stops, you know, we're, we're to be judged by our actions, the things that we do and the things that we don't do. And you might say, wait, Nash, you're talking about works-based salvation. That's not how it works. You're right. We are saved by what? By grace, not by works. Otherwise, we could brag about it. You know what? i got nothing to brag about except Jesus Christ. That's it. And my salvation is from him and from him alone and his grace and grace alone. But because I am saved, I will act differently. If I'm going to take it seriously, you're going to see evidence of my salvation. We call that spiritual fruit, right? And i got to tell you, if you don't have any fruit in your life, you need to re-examine your relationship with the vine, the Father. He's the vine, we're the branches. The fruit comes on the branches, but without the vine, the fruit can't happen. And that's how it works spiritually as well. You see, Jesus is speaking just the words that God has told him to speak. Jesus expects us to behave ourselves the way God would have us to behave ourselves. As the hymn says, they will know we are Christians. How? By our love. So we need to love our neighbors. We need to love God our enemies. Bobby, I loved that part of your prayer, and I'm with you. It's hard sometimes to pray for folks that are doing you wrong. It's hard for me to stand before the Lord and advocate for the Taliban, but I need to be praying for their salvation. In just a few, just a few weeks, we're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And, and during that time, I remember a lot of people asking the questions, how, can we have keep, how could we have kept this from happening? I'll tell you how we can keep it from happening. If those terrorists get saved, they ain't doing that anymore. The gospel is the answer to everything that ails us, to all of our troubles and all of our difficulties. Verse 50 closes this section with just really an amazing note of hope. What, what do the words of Christ lead to? What do the words of God through Christ lead to? They lead to eternal salvation, eternity with God. The command that God the Father has spoken by God through the Son, Jesus, is the word that gives eternal life. This comes through faith in Jesus Christ. This comes through a perfect relationship with the Father that is only possible because of the sacrifice of the Son on the cross. And this eternal life that God promises isn't just some kind of eternal existence. It's not just kind of sticking around forever. No, what God promises us is abundant life, life to the fullest. And we need to remember there are only two forces at work here. There are only two sides. And we've got to choose sides, folks, today and every day. There's Satan and there's God. That's it. There is no in-between. There is no neutral you're going to serve one or you're going to serve the other. John explained this in chapter 10. John 10.10 10 tells us of these two forces. The thief, that Satan, comes only to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. I, this is Jesus speaking, have come so that they may have life. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because they may have life in abundance. God just doesn't want to give us eternal life just so we'll stick around forever. God wants to give us an eternal life that is so full of joy, that is so full of love, that is so full of light, that we can't even comprehend it. Our brain is incapable of comprehending the love and the largeness of God. And only when we stand before him and see him face to face will we truly understand the depth of his love because it's more than we can possibly imagine. That's the God we serve, folks. That's the God that we need to take a stand for. That's the God that we need to do everything we can to serve him. And John's been saying this throughout his entire gospel. John 1, 4 says, life was in him, 
And that life was the light of men. We experience this life through receiving him and enjoying a relationship with God. As John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. Because of Jesus and only because of Jesus are we a member of the family of God. We are in this family of God sharing life because of John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son has revealed him. We've never seen God the Father, have we? But we've seen him through Jesus. And those who see us living this life that God has given us should also see Jesus. See, John has shown us the Word, the one and only Son of God, capital W Word. And we need to pay attention to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. John showed us Jesus by how Jesus did life with the disciples. We should go and do likewise and just live a life for him, always on mission for him and always pointing others to Jesus. Some people met Jesus and believed with all of their hearts and all of their souls. And we praise him for that. Some met him and believed, but not with enough passion to take a stand for them, for him. We pray for them that they will grow in their faith as we pray for us, that we will continue to grow in our faith, to be able to take a stand whenever that is necessary. But unfortunately, some have met him and rejected him and his teachings, and through that, rejected God himself. So my question for all of us is, what about you? What are you going to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with this message? What are you going to do with the fact that we need to live for him in everything that we do? Because, folks, that's where the rubber really meets the road, right? We can talk about the Bible. We can learn about the Bible. But it's all theoretical until we put it into practice. And we're called to glorify God in absolutely everything that we do. So I want all of us to take a look at our lives. Are we truly living for Jesus in everything that we do? If we have to ask ourselves that question and we don't come up with an immediate yes, we need to start looking at why. We need to start cleaning out some of those corners of our lives. There's nothing wrong with that because we all got them, folks. I'm not telling you to do anything that I don't need to do myself. All of us need to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ by continuing to give him control of more and more and more. So what are you going to do with Jesus? Don't expect the storybook Christian movie ending, right? Not in this life. Because in this life we will have trouble. But i got to tell you, the ending ending is going to be greater than we can imagine. I've read the back of the book, folks, and we win. One day Jesus is going to return, and when he returns, he's going to establish a kingdom in his name. And in that kingdom, guess what? God's way goes. And that's what it should be for each and every one of us today. It's not a lot of fun all the time to do self-reflection, though, is it? But a lot of times I look in the mirror and I don't really like what I see. But there's no way we can fix the problems until we see them. So let's truly search our hearts and live for him in everything that we do and glorify God always. We're getting ready to have a hymn of invitation. And during this hymn of invitation, of course, the altar is open. I'm down front and I'd love to talk with you and pray with you, but you can do business with God right where you are. If it's sitting in a pew here in the church or if it's sitting in your living room at home or wherever you're watching and listening to this, the reality is God is there with you right now. It's my prayer that you will use this time as we sing together and ask him, God, help me see where I am so I can become a better servant of yours. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us. Pray, Father, that you will help us, Lord. Help us to live for you in everything that we do. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in all that we do. Help us, Lord, to seek your glory, not our own. Help us.
to give you that throne of our hearts and of our lives so that you are in control and not us. You're calling us today, Lord. Help us to respond and simply come home. We ask all this, Lord, in your precious, holy, and wonderful name. Amen.